Welcome everyone to the Come to Believe Network's fourth panel discussion, Why the Trade-Off, Learning and Earning in Higher Ed. My name is Sam Adams and I am the Education Programs Manager here at CTB and we're thrilled that you can join us this morning. If you're unfamiliar with CTB, uh, here's a little bit of background information before we get started. The Come to Believe Network was formed to provide higher education institutions, especially selective four-year colleges, with an innovative results-oriented two-year college model that is accessible to students who are often underrepresented at these selective universities. So we, uh, CTB works with colleges and universities around the country to explore and replicate the model as it's already been implemented in two places, Arupe College on the campus of Loyola University of Chicago and Doherty Family College at the University of St. Thomas. Now importantly, the CTB model provides both a credential, an associate's degree, and a pathway to a bachelor's degree. We refer to this as a better normal for higher ed access. Part of that better normal is understanding and being intentional about the importance of student employment and students' aspirations for their professional careers as part of the college process. And that's gonna be the focus of our discussion today. Just a brief overview of our time together. I'm gonna to do a brief introduction of our panelists. Uh, we'll have a research presentation from Dr. Lizette Nieves, a little bit more about her later. And then we'll have a panel discussion with time reserved at the end for audience Q&A. If you have any questions that come up at any point, you can use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions and we'll be sure to get to them before the end of the panel. So a little bit about our panelists. We're gonna start with our research presenter, Dr. Lizette Nieves, who's the president of the Fund for the City of New York, FCNY, an institution charged with developing and helping to implement innovations in policy, programs, practices, and technology in order to advance the functioning of government and nonprofit organizations in New York City and beyond. Lizette is also a distinguished clinical instructor with NYU, overseeing doctoral students and supporting research initiatives. Lizette holds a BA from Brooklyn College, a BA MA from the University of Oxford, an MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University, and a doctorate with distinction in higher education management at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also a Truman Scholar, a Rhodes Scholar, an Aspen Bahara Fellow, and a Richard P. Nathan Public Policy Fellow. Joining us as a panelist is Chris Donnelly, who's the founding director of the Professional Internship Program for Doherty Family College at the University of St. Thomas. Chris spent 15 years in magazine publishing before shifting over to work in education and workforce development with a specific emphasis on equity and inclusion. In her transition to education, Chris served as the executive director of the corporate work study program for Cristo Rey Jesuit High School in Minneapolis. Chris graduated summa cum laude from the University of St. Thomas with a degree in international business and Spanish and became a double Tommy when she completed her executive MBA. She's on the board of directors for YMCA Camp Woodgy uh, Wagon and is a member of the Leadership St. Paul class of 2018. Chris lives in South Minneapolis with her husband, children, and cats. Our next panelist is Carlos Martinez, who's an Associate Brand and Communications Manager at the Come to Believe Network. He was born in Chicago, Illinois, where he currently resides. Carlos is of Mexican and Peruvian descent and grew up in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. Carlos is a 2019 graduate of Rupe College and graduated from Loyola University in Chicago in 2021 with a degree in communications. His passion is learning, practicing, and educating others about the servant leadership philosophy. Carlos is also the co-founder of his own nonprofit called Serving People with a Mission, where he seeks to provide high school and college students with leadership development and community service programming. We're also joined by another Arupe College alumni, Judy Dominguez, grew up in the back of the Yards neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Judy is a self-driven, detail-oriented individual with a passion for helping her community. Judy is an IT assurance associate at Grant Thornton, where she audits IT general controls. At Grant Thornton, Judy is uh, also is chair of the Community Outreach Committee for the Veterans and Allies Business Resource Group. And she's an, uh, an alumna of Arupe College and Loyola University of Chicago's Quinlan School of Business. And finally, our host today is uh, Father Steve Katsuris, SJ, the president and CEO of the Come to Believe Network. From 2014 until August 2020, Father Katsuris served as the founding dean and executive director of Arupe College at Loyola University Chicago. Arupe is a two-year college that continues the Jesuit tradition 
of offering a rigorous liberal arts education to a diverse population, many of whom are the first in their family to pursue higher education. Because of the success of Rupe College, Father Katsuris moved to New York in August 2020 to launch Come to Believe, a network that will replicate and scale the Arupe model nationally. So welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us. Our research presentation today from Dr. Nieves is uh, on a, based on an article that she recently published called I Need You to See All of Me, Latinx Students for Mixed Immigration Status Families Speak Out on School and Work Roles and Offer Lessons for Latinx Community College Leaders. In the article, Dr. Nieves explores how the American post-secondary system has created an unnecessary trade-off between commitments of school and the need and desire of students to work. In policy discussions about higher education, student employment is often considered a risk factor, but research actually suggests that working uh, can increase engagement academically and improve academic outcomes. In the article, uh, Dr. Nieves focuses on what she terms a worker lens, a worker lens which functions as an identity that manifests in students who value school and work equally while providing them, while priding themselves on their work ethic and contribution to their families. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nieves for a research presentation. Welcome. The worker lens is particularly focused when I talk about that on more low income first gen full time community college students right that's where i've seen it manifested a bit more. Um, for many of these low income young adults work is not a distraction, as I said it's a central identity right it's an important role right I in fact when I would meet with my young people in my work first program we would talk about it. And they would come up to me and they say oh you know. Um, or students have had and they'll say to me, oh, you know, I have to work. And the first thing I always say is, congratulations, that's great. How'd you get your job? Tell me about that. And that's like a whole new thing. Oh, this, I said, what are you learning about yourself? And then all of a sudden that part of them as an adult that is a contributor or a young person that's a contributor, not someone that's just supposed to be digesting is visible. Do you see that? And that's where agency is born, right? So we see here that community colleges seek partners and greater curriculum alignment are needed to capture the interest and encourage this type of um, what I call persistence, right? And because I believe that after up to a certain amount of hours, work is actually a motivation and incentive, right? And we know that. What I noticed in the literature though, very little had been written, particularly about people under 24. Most of my work focused on people 18 to 24, focused on 25 and over. 25 and over, work was seen as a central identity. This is not anything new, right? Oh my goodness, it was seen as, oh, the adult learner. Yes, they come, this is their identity. Look at Carlos, the way he shows up in class and look at Anna, the way they show up in class, right? This is part of who they are and we accept that. But with young people between 18 and 24, we actually, you know, I should say, in some ways, infantilized. Maybe that's not that's too strong a word, but it's almost like we don't accept that the worker identity starts much earlier, and that it's a key piece to persistence and motivation, right? And even if, because I think this part is important, even if the work is not related to the end career goals that they have, it functions as an identity of independence and motivation. And so what we easily see in a 25 and older as an asset, we didn't necessarily see as an asset in younger people. And I will say the literature now it's shifting, but the literature really shows work almost as a negative for African-American students and Asian students, which is just not acceptable, right? Because we, these identities, you have to understand them a little bit more. So, um, so this gets a little bit under that. Five emergent things immigrant status and work, right? This idea of work not being something that is taken for granted and it's always in the context of the ecosystem of the family. What is immigrant status of the family? And I think that's an important one too. And yes, that has its stressors in relationship to that. There's no question, but that also frames a schema of why work and the importance of work. And I would say that's important for also first generation students, right? The other thing we saw was the family persistence, family and the persistent fear of deportation. Whether it was a student or it was a parent member, that they were always conscious of deportation. 
All right? So we talk about this idea of cellular age and stress, all right? right? Think about that as a constant piece because it's, again, it's not about the individual, it's about the family, right? And how to understand that as a larger family. Another theme is the idea of earliest memories of school and work. And these were really powerful if you get a chance to actually read um, the book Working to Learn, but also some in the article as well too, because when these early memories were incredible ways of transmitting lessons and bonding, particularly amongst our male uh, participants in the study right? For them and the male role models, it was actually through work that they had some of the most, uh, what I would call intimate conversations around family. And, you know, I always think of one student who, who talked a lot about how he would go with his grandfather, at, you know, 5 a.m. on the bakery run, right? And that's where he learned all about like where he came from and what it meant, and, uh, right? Like, so, you know, this idea of his other key part of his identity, of where his pueblo was, his, his, his Latinx identity, all that came through the exchange through work, right? So yeah, you know, you can look at it one way and then I think the field has done that. Say, oh my God, people are working and they're not having time. Actually, people are integrating in ways that are unbelievably creative, right? That they are family first, even under stress and they're communicating these messages, but they're not communicating the messages of family and bonding and theme at the traditional places that people may think that, right? But it doesn't make it any less important. And then I'd say this idea of this intersecting identities and participating in a family wage. So the, um, the British talk about family wage a little bit different than the way that I would. When I talk about family wage, I talk about it as something that has a level of enormous pride that has contributed to a group, right? And so often for first generation folks, they understand that, right? I know that at a certain age when I'm working, I'm gonna to contribute to X. I may contribute to the groceries. I may be doing this, right? And that also elevates their status in the family. They see their connection to that. This is not always, it's not always a negative thing. I think that's important too. What is the, what is the class lens by which you're viewing this, right? This is where the literature has been fascinating to me, right? And that these identities overlap with each other, right? They are quite intersectional, right? It's not one over, necessarily all the time over another, right? And then another theme is what does support look like for these particular students? What does it mean when you're balancing a very strong worker lens and you see that as part of who you are? Because as part of who your family is and what you're linked to, right? And you're also on your way to learn. Now, I'm, I was going to add this and I thought about taking that away, but I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to mix, I'm going to move that slide because that talks about what are some COVID implications that happen particularly to this population. But I don't wanna, I'm not gonna take us off track just yet. We could always go back to that slide later and I could talk about those. But I wanna talk a little bit about this, particularly about immigration status and work, right? So this one here and some of the quotes because I felt really strong about how do we make sure that it's in the language of the young adults that they are speaking, that they are speaking and thought of and held with dignity in their points. And um, so I'll say this, um, with her approved DACA status, Anna, a Latinx freshman in Phoenix, um, could now be part of a social group in a full way she had not been in the past. So when she talks about her identity it was related to her, right? She became a DACA student in college and then realized, whoa, socially that she can have some greater integration, right? Didn't take away from her family connection that she felt, right? And she also talked about her parents' fear of working had more to do with not having options than with her freedom to choose. Anna admits to being a good student, but she loves earning money and feel as if she will be an independent woman once she earns a degree. Something that she's not always seen in her family, right? This was actually really important for her, right? She knows she's breaking the mold and she's proud and doing that. And this was an interesting one because it was about, and we went into this deep, deep conversation and I just listened and it was really about saying, wow, she understood work as independence for her too. So this also had a really interesting gender aspect to it. That's a whole other level of research. We can't go deep dive on all of them, but I think that this, you talk about the identities of gender as well too, right? The persistence of fear of deportation, um, we know that, I, we've seen that, we've experienced that. Um, for many of us on, um, on the panel know this almost too intimately, right? This is not something that is uh, through literature, right? Um, 
you know, and we see this with DACA, particularly with DACA students, because I think this part is really important that we did talk uh, that we talked about when the young adult is the one that has the status, the amount of responsibility that they experience, right? Um, and it's not always necessarily negative responsibility. It's around a familial responsibility that they have to have, right? Um, things like travel and driving. And I would say most of the, particularly the students that were DACA were the first in their families to ever have property in their name, a car note in their name, those kinds of things. Like that's actually really important to understand. So having that worker lens early was actually really important because it showed them a lot around how to balance these multiple responsibilities. Benjamin feels optimistic about his future. He's quite somber when he speaks of his family. He knows they're struggling. Uh, he worries about their deportation, but he worries about how they're managing their stress. Remember, all my research was done before COVID. This is pre-COVID, right? COVID magnified all of these issues, right? And every single young person I talked to mentioned stress. But you know what they also mentioned? Joy, love, and family, okay? Because I think that's also stripped from our narratives as Latinx that I think want to make sure that that's not taken away. So Scarlett, um, early memories of school and work, uh, had, you know, why she needed to value school and work. So this is the other part was that through this lens, it was like, you know, Latinx families have a strong connection identity to school, irrespective of if they received a degree or not, right? Right, so we're, you know, so she felt really strong about where she decided to work, where she would compromise or not compromise. I mean, I thought those things were really powerful. She uses her college transcript as, a, as an inspiration. At the end of each semester, she goes to her mentor and says, I am one step closer to the life I want and not the life that I have, right? This idea that you can expand that. But it's also, I wanna say, when I spoke to all these young people and they were very conscious of if they had families that were undocumented, they were conscious of the exploitive work practices. Absolutely, I'm not gonna ignore that. But they were also really conscious of what it meant to show up and be committed to each other, right? That was a high, high piece that was really important there, right? Uh, so some of them too, we, we saw that the stress that sometimes happens, particularly when you contribute to a family, when a family member is ill, right? This ecosystem, how are our young adults, right? I always say our young people are making very adult decisions. So when the literature treats them as having um, these stereotypical young adolescent lives, and young adult lives that are focused on themselves, which the literature says is supposed to be happy developmentally, that's not the reality, right? And that, I just, I, I feel like that needs to, to get out there sometimes too, because talking to these students and seeing what they're juggling is, uh, is pretty amazing. Uh, John's father was unable to work, work-related illness, right? For John seeing his family or did elicit emotions of loneliness, right? and frustration, desperation, he had, to, he, had to, he had to manage those. But one thing about, I think that's important about John is John actually really helped to navigate and found a local clinic where his father for the first time could manage and deal with stress. He became the navigator because he got that through working, right? I think that's a really powerful piece of how it feeds the family ecosystem. What does support look like? You know, when we always think about this too, um, you know, support looks like, and, I, and I'll say this in short too, is that it's about an understanding where students work whenever we have opportunities where we can have students work and get paid as well as get credit is extremely important, right? So what does that mean to create internships where students can also be involved in creating where those can happen? I think we assume that they don't have the social currency in the working market to do that. And actually some do more than we think, right? We can help them navigate maybe something that may be more career directed. But the point is that there, this can be a way where it's an empowering way too, right? Um, I think the other thing that we wanna to do too is that it's not about shaming students who work, right? It's about really understanding the nature and how they work, helping students think about trade-offs and priorities and understanding the goals and motivations. And starting always with the goal first versus 
the shame, right? So, uh, you know, I talked to one student, I didn't get to put it in here, but, but if, if you read my dissertation, you will have seen that too. One of them that I thought was fascinating, one student talked about how uh, a teacher had called his house and told his mother, and, you know, you're making him work and pretty much saying that she was going to have ACS or family services intervene, that she was concerned. And um, the student was mortified, right? Um, because a student wasn't working these egregious hours, all these types of things. It was this, um, the teacher may have been well-intentioned, the teacher didn't understand the context, the teacher stripped them of their dignity. There was a lot of things that happened in that, right? I, I could, I don't need to go as deep into that, but this idea of seeking to understand is really important first step understanding where the student is at. So for many key takeaways, many worker students, post-secondary students need to reconceptualize as an experience what promotes educational outcomes, include work in that, achieve a greater link between student employment and positive student educational outcomes. The voice of the student needs to be at the forefront. They have to create an environment and curriculum that better supports and prepares students for success in dual priorities of work and school. So what does that look like? You know, we could think about that too. We see that doing with some, have some internship tracks very early versus later in the experience, right? That actually is a really powerful way of showing that this is gonna be an important um, link to the end goal, right? We often wait very late for an internship experience. The truth is putting them up front is a key motivator and incentive. Um, and we saw that too, when we did that with freshmen, it was pretty unbelievable. They couldn't believe that they would get an internship in their first year. Right, High support for high workforce engagement, high expectational environment can make a big difference in the ability of the, to contribute or to, to, as we say, experience what we may call the American dream, but I call it greater integration into the mainstream American economy. So I went quite, a, I, I was kind of quick because I know all of you are really thoughtful, exciting, interesting people that want to have a conversation. So just giving you a touch point, I guess I will end by saying this. Look, at the end of the day, we have an incredibly diverse set of students that are coming to community college. And we have younger Latino students that are coming to community college. And many were first generation and many will be working and many have ties to their families, right? And as a result of that, they need to be embraced for that connection not shamed or penalized for that connection. And so how do we put internships up front? How do we figure out, how do we make schedules that actually work with students who work for younger people? We only think about that for older people. Actually, I loved it when I started seeing younger people going to school at different hours. They thought, oh, those were all the adult workers. No, the younger folks were doing it because they were also juggling many things. And so I'd say, you know, there are many more as, as far as also what is the lens counseling can have, right? We can go through that too. We know what it means to come from a place where we see someone as an asset, right? Versus a place where they feel shamed, right? And that's, that's work that can be done with counselors as well too. But I will stop there because I now want to turn it over to all of you. And I hope I didn't go over my time. All right, so Steve, I get to turn it to you. Well, Lizette, thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing that. You know, um, I first became aware of Lizette through a mutual friend of ours, uh, CTV board member, Jane Martinez Dowling. And when I read uh, your, um, your piece, uh, I just thought this is a, such important research, uh, so critical for, um, our work at Doherty Family College, at Arupe College, and at, uh, at Come to Believe. You know, I want to hear from um, uh, our colleagues uh, on this panel. So, you know, how do these findings align with your experiences, either as college students or as the professional supporting students as they navigate both school and work? I definitely have some great thoughts and Lizette, this was wonderful. It actually, it, it strikes into a lot of what I've learned with our students, but I would prefer to hear from Carlos and Judy 
first. <laughs> I guess I could start. Well, this, the, and also, once again, sorry for my voice, also getting over a call. Um, but honestly, it, just listening to that makes me a little bit sad of relief knowing that I'm not the only one who struggles with this. I am the oldest of three, also doctor recipient, and the only one. My two brothers are you. We're born here. And my, as the oldest and the only one who chose to go to college, I and my family safety net. What yeah. I do relate to ensuring that they're also going to be successful in whatever path they chose. My brothers are both in the military. We're transitioning one month and then back to civilian life right now. So it's my focus is that throughout college was me preparing for when they come back for them to be ready for success so just knowing that other people also prioritize family and you know other people other my peers don't sometimes their families their support but I'm the one supporting my family so mm -hmm. that was my enlightenment thanks for that Judy uh Carlos how about you yeah um well, first of all, Lisette, thank you so much for doing this. I think this is such a powerful research and it highlights the truth that many of us experience. Uh, I am not DACA, but I still relate to a lot of the experiences that are shared uh, throughout the article, throughout the research and what Judy, you just mentioned, it clicks with me as well. I mean, as a student worker, um, it was very important for me to not only help sustain my personal needs, and once, I mean, I started asking, I stopped asking my mother for help. I think when I was in high school, I think that's when I stopped asking for money or asking for candy or uh, anything. I just kind of just became my own person because I knew that my mother was not able to afford uh, giving me the things that I needed or wanted at the time. So when I got to college, started working, at one point I was working probably three jobs because I needed to, again, support myself, but also try to support my mother in the best way that I could. Um, and uh, from my young, young age, I've been doing that, not only financially, but I've had to also support in other ways, like maybe translating because she wasn't able to understand something in, in English uh, and she needed to read a document or sign some papers. So I think it kind of is whole, it's this entire pattern that we're expected and not only that, but we need to, and we want to help our families because they need that help. So that's how it aligns with me. And it's just very powerful. Thanks for that, Carlos. So Chris, uh, again, I'm really um, eager to hear your response to all of this. You know, Darty Family College was really the, the leader in terms of prioritizing student employment mm -hmm. since you opened. You were ahead of Arupe uh, in, in terms of this. I always envied you uh, for, for, for that. I thought that you created opportunities more quickly for students, uh, for internships. So talk about that a little bit. And uh, I mean, you, you were one of the pioneers of Darty Family College and you're still there. So I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear about your experience. Absolutely. Well, so for us, we embedded the idea of the internship program right from the start, as you mentioned. Um, so, and set it up as an expectation for students, right? Which was an interesting space because it is at, at, at Doherty, it's not, um, it's not a graduation requirement. So you think about choice, right? An agency for students, like this is their choice. It's not a graduation requirement. Um, and it's a non-credit course they take as a preparation. Mm -hmm. But I also tell students, this is the only course you'll ever take in college that's free, right? right? You get actually get a free class and that never happens, <laughs> no tuition. <laughs> and then you get paid internships at the end. So for us, it was embedded in the very beginning. Um, and I think we're working hard still to do is to figure out the, uh, the best ways to integrate it um, yes, with our other good. academics, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other piece. And so mm -hmm. working on our career readiness outcomes that will span all of what Doherty does. Um, so our students take a one semester preparation course, professional development course, their freshman year. And it's not about like learning the, the professional behaviors and expectations of the workforce. It's much more about uh, self-exploration, right? We talk about social identities and bias and what that means for you and what's going to mean in the workplace. Um, we talk about, we use strengths finders, right? So the students start to see themselves as the asset lens and start to think about how all of those skills they already have are transferable to a professional setting because that's what's so key, right? And this is that integration of where work and school come together 
and build each other up. But students, particularly a college freshman, you know, first time freshman at 19 years old, doesn't necessarily see the transferability of those skills. Thanks for that, Chris. I want to shift back to, to Judy. Judy, it's so good to see you. Um, I know that um, your work at Grant Thornton was a huge mm -hmm. part of your experience at Arupe. And then when you went across the street to Loyola Chicago's um, <laughs> Uh, Quinlan School of Business. So talk about that. Talk about how you um, landed at Grant Thornton. And now, I mean, you're continuing on at Grant Thornton. Uh, uh, share that with our with our panel and with our listeners uh, today, Judy. Yeah, so I actually interviewed for a program Grant Thornton started my freshman year. So it is crazy to think that I will be coming up at five years at GT. And yeah. But honestly, during my time there and just starting out so early on, helped me stay focused on my end goal, which was getting a post-secondary degree to be able to continue on my career. I knew I wanted to be an auditor early on. So then just being in an environment where I saw people who had professional, successful careers in the practice I wanted to help me stay focused. And one of my earliest and favorite memories at GT is that um, I also got like essentially free tutors because my classes directly aligned to what I was working on my internship. So that actually helped me a lot. Okay. And, you know, I mean, I remember this, one of my colleagues or two of my colleagues at Arupe um, were involved with, with Grant Thornton. What was that like for you when Arupe was bringing in these representatives from Grant Thornton to speak with you and other, uh, your, you know, some of your classmates? <clears throat> Sorry. It was actually great knowing that we had a support system at Arupe of people that were looking out for us to ensure that we were successful. I don't, they were just like, hey, there's this program. I know you're interested, come apply to it. And they were like, did you already apply? Just that encouragement, always something. And then once the program started, the content of the constant them checking up on us to see that ensuring that we were doing well, asking us questions, how we were doing, ensuring that we were performing and then ensuring that we were also still keeping on track with our classes too. Terrific, and then, you know, before I shift to Carlos again, Judy, I mean, you know, you continued on at Grant Thornton when you were getting your bachelor's and now you're full-time at, at Grant Thornton. What was, what's that evolution been like? It's been interesting. I like enjoyed my time. Like, the story, like she was saying, I also had to take night classes just to ensure I got enough hours in my internship to ensure that I continue because I was enjoying what I was doing at work. Well, I still enjoy what I do at work. So definitely like that. Terrific. All right. Thank you. So Carlos, now your experience of working while you were at Arup Bay and then continuing continuing on while you were at um, Loyola Chicago, what was that like for you? How did it impact your experience as a student and as your you know, development as a, as a professional? Of course. Um, before I, I answer that, I wanted to mention, Chris, I think it's amazing what, you ha what you've been doing at DFC. I think it's such a cool thing to hear that you're essentially helping students align their passions and the things that, that they want to pursue with an actual hands-on experience. Because I've been working with high school students this past six months mm -hmm. through my nonprofit, aside from CTV. Uh, and you can tell that they need that, that they want to learn and to grow, but they also want to have fun and to, you know, continue finding what it is that they like to do. So I think that that's amazing and props to you all for that. Uh, but Father Katoris, to answer your question, um, I, like I mentioned, I did have like three jobs at Arupe when I started. Uh, and that was th thanks to the jobs coordinator at Arupe uh, who helped Arupe students get jobs or internships. I forget the exact uh, name of the title, but but they were very helpful. They got, they were able to uh, help me find like a job through work study, but then I needed more money because I needed to cover some personal expenses. So they helped me find another job aside from work study. And then I was also doing, um, you know, extracurricular activities because I was always downtown and Arup is located in downtown Chicago. So having work and then having my extracurriculars were ways for me to help myself but also continue expanding my network meeting people spending time with friends so that's i think the most important thing and adding on to that 
I was also able to find a balance and learn how to prioritize the things that I did that I needed to do. Um, having to juggle so many things at a time helped me, you know, organize myself better. I was able to ask for help or maybe extra time when it came to an assignment or a project that I needed to do for school. So I didn't really see it as a struggle or as a, you know, doing the most. I, I actually was having fun doing the things that I was doing because I was, again, supporting myself and helping my, helping my mom at home. But I was also able to spend time at Arupe, which is a place that I love. And I was able to see my friends in a regular basis through the extracurricular activities that I was doing. All right, Carlos, thanks. And I think you've got something for me now, is that right? Yes, uh, I actually do have a question for you, Father Katsouris. Uh, during your time at Arupe, what did you learn about the importance of student employment? And, and how do you think colleges can better support students uh, when it comes to their professional development? So I became aware very early on about the cost opportunity. By that, I mean that for students to go to Arupe and then of course to DFC, to Doherty Family College, you know, the goal is students graduate with little to no debt. Um, that said, um, students and their families need income. So even though the expenses at Arupe and Doherty Family College are kept to a minimum, there are still just other uh, expenses that, that students need to address. And so, uh, and then I became very aware um, with our undocumented population, the challenges and the stresses there in terms of finding employment opportunities for, for students who are undocumented. You know, Lizette, what you talked about um, juggling and then it's really, it is navigating um, and, and assets. You know, I found that our students had extraordinary mm. assets that were attractive to employers because they were just so adept at, at, at navigating, um, whether it was commuting, family situations, um, you know, being first gen students, the resilience and, and the character strength that, that requires. But I, I think the other thing that I was um, uh, very focused on was, and this is true, not just for Arupe or Darty Family College students, but for all students, the importance of social capital building, of, of networking, you know? And so I've been kind of conflicted through the years. On one hand, I was always grateful to Loyola for making work study opportunities available to our root-based students. And on one hand, that was great for root-based students because, you know, the university work study situations understood, oh, well, it's midterm time or it's finals time. So they were, um, you know, understanding of students' schedules and needs need to study. Well, on the other hand, there were less opportunities for students to um, increase their social capital networking uh, and network building by working at the university. And so, you know, I think one of the things that um, I've learned, you know, through the years as Dean of Arupe, now as uh, working at Come to Believe, is focusing on what Chris, you've done so beautifully uh, from the beginning is focusing on those relationships, you know, in the larger community. At Arupe, we call the position the employer relations director. So really identifying employers who see these students as assets, who see their, their, their backgrounds as something that will benefit their organization will help them network, you know, that kind of a thing. We're looking for pipelines of diverse workers with talents and with credentials. And uh, so that to me has been a, a great learning. And then just even most recently, you know, Lizette, you mentioned COVID, which has of course changed everything. You know, so many times I hear from students, oh, well, family first, family first, family first. And that often means I can't go to school, so family first. The key word is integration. We have to integrate how we work, how we earn, while we are learning. You know? Absolutely. And that's such a challenge for this old mindset of either or. Yes. No, it's got to be a both and. So now in my work and my colleagues' work at CTV, when we're talking to university leaders around the country and they're planning for their versions of their two-year colleges, you need someone from your career services center or whatever you call it in your campus to be part of the planning so that they're already identifying, Chris, what you do, those paid internships or other employers who will be interested in working with these students. And finally, Lizette, you know, your research really bore out what was always my gut, my hunch, 
you know, I always encourage students at Arup Bay to work 20 to 25 hours a week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're a full-time student, if you're commuting, mm -hmm. if you have other family obligations, if you want to have a life, you know, working uh, more than 25 hours was just, was such a challenge. It's, uh, it's such that's a correct. Challenge. Yep, that's, that's, yep, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So Chris, I want to turn this back to you. Based on your experience working with those external partners, what role do employers play in the student's professional development and how can they optimize their support for students like, like your students at DFC? I love to tell our all of our professional partners that um, this is their opportunity, right? To, I mean, they, they know they have a workforce shortage and they know that the, the demographics of the workforce are changing. So this is their opportunity to help create the talent that they want to have. Um, and it's an opportunity to help students dream big. I tell our students, they need to dream bigger, right? All the time, You're, you know, you only know about the jobs that you know about and you don't know about all these amazing things that are out there. So the, the work partner has a huge responsibility in bringing a student in and showing them the breadth of all the different things that they can do. Um, I think the other thing they can really do to help a student develop is start connecting college majors to career pathways. Um, because that's one thing that really seems to throw students off, right? I have to choose what I want to study because that determines what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And those of us who've been in the workforce know that's not true, but they don't see what those connections are, and particularly as it'll lead them into those early career steps. So that's an important piece. I think the next um, most important responsibility that the work partners can bring is how they mentor students. All right, so it shouldn't just be that they show up and they do a job. It's also like, how are you mentoring them? How are you connecting them to a network, right? And starting to build that social capital. It's no different than any other human, right? A student also wants to feel like they belong and that their contributions have value and that builds confidence in them. And so to look at interns in the same way that they look at development of the rest of their workforce is I think a really important piece but with added transparency and clarity of expectations because they're still learning. That's great. I love your dream big. You dream that? bigger. Yeah, that, 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 that's <laughs> awesome. All right, so back to Carlos and Judy. All right, if you could turn back time, you're both out of college now, you're both wildly successful, but you're looking back on your college experience, your wisdom figures for us. What do you wish you would have known then that would have improved your experience either as a student or a professional? So if you could turn back the clock a little bit to your first year at Arup Bay, what would you do differently? I can actually go ahead and answer that one. I, I think, and I learned this while at Arup Bay, um, while getting immersed in all the opportunities that Aruba provided for the students, I learned that the it is very important to make connections, but not just like a, a one time deal type of thing. Like you have to build upon the connections that you make. I mean, I work for my former dean, Father Katoris. So that kind of shows you that the power of the connections, you know, Judy, she's the board member for my nonprofit. And we're also friends. So you never know what will happen when you put yourself out there and try to actually get to know people and how you can help them and how they can help you. And that's something that I think every single student should take with them and care with themselves as they move along throughout high school, even throughout college and even after. Thank you for that. Judy, how about yourself? I was thinking the exact same thing. Somebody once told me you build your network when you less need it. And that is one thing I wish I would have been more intentional, not just meeting the person once and connecting when I'm LinkedIn, actually sending them follow-up messages. Because you said you don't know the people you're meeting could also be helpful. Like it's Carlos, we're friends, we're board members and we're colleagues. So it's been a great experience. So, yeah. Terrific. Thank you for that. There might be some Q&A. Sam, uh, are, do you want to take it from here with uh, any questions from our uh, listening uh, audience here? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I'm, uh, I feel like it's just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, uh, put it back to you. And then maybe, Chris, I'd be interested in your take on this as well. Uh, Lizette, when you were talking earlier, you mentioned the importance of scheduling um, and how if we have to pay attention to student schedules as we think about the best way to support them. So I feel like it's serious. When you think about Arupe, how they supported students, how did the calendar, the way the classes were set up, factor into student success? Um, because I think that's a really important factor here. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And Judy and Carlos, you might have a perspective on this as well. It's a challenge, you know, and I think DFC had a little bit of this as well. I mean, we, you know, uh, morning and afternoon cohorts, four days a week. Um, our focus was, you know, first and foremost for students to complete their degrees in two years or as quickly as possible. Um, and so sometimes it was hard to find employers. I mean, I remember one of our board members saying to me, Steve, you're killing me. I mean, you know, it's just uh, uh, the students can only work, you know, on Wednesdays or maybe on, you know, he ran, ran a bank. So, OK, they could work, you know, half a day on Saturday. But, um, you know, that was fortunate that his bank had a branch very near Arupe, really within walking distance. So that was a help. So, you know, uh, students could take classes in the morning and then, you know, run over in the afternoon or vice versa. But that was that was a challenge. And then, you know, um, Chris, you're graduating this spring, whereas Arupe, our delivery method was that the students are in classes year round. Um, so that does prevent students from doing summer internships. And my colleagues and I have continued that discussion. Maybe the first summer, you know, in between first and second year, the summer session should happen, but the second summer, it might be wiser for students to be in a full-time internship paid internship, that, that kind of thing. So there are challenges to it. I mean, again, um, we were fortunate in that, you know, um, Carlos and Judy, you know this, I mean, we really networked in Chicago. We used the Loyola University brand, which is so strong in Chicago, to find employers who were, um, once they met people like Judy and Carlos, were like, of course we want to employ uh, these great students. So we'll make it happen, even though it's not ideal for us that they're working half days, two days a week, and then, you know, all day on Wednesday or whatever it might be. So, yeah, Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, our, I think at, at, at Doherty, it's even more complicated because we are a cohort model, right? So this class scheduling is that way, and it's designed as a full-time for four semesters with the summers off. Um, so that's that there's already that space and that complication. Uh, we've also then really spent a lot of time with sort of an iterative design method and listening to our partners. Um, and summers are important. Like in the beginning, we weren't trying to, you know, to, to force the, the internship into summers. And now it's summer and school year. And in school year, we intentionally don't have any classes on Tuesday. So that's the internship day. Um, and so the idea is ideally, right, a student can start and have a full-time internship or part-time over the summer between first and second year, and then continue on the Tuesdays. Also, we don't have January classes, so they can increase hours then, but it's taken a lot of flexibility to try and find that space. Also knowing our students aren't going to give up their other part-time jobs because they are helping support them and their families. And so in some ways that kept evenings and weekends free for them to be able to do both. Um, and so I, th I think we're finding the, you know, the blend that's going to work, but we're not all the way there yet. All right, our next question, I'm going to go back to our, uh, our two young professional stars. So Carlos, I'll start with you. You mentioned this a little bit about uh, how working and, and learning at the same time allowed you to build time management. I'm really curious, as you have started your career now, what skills that you were able to develop uh, either at Arupe that you use in your job or that you developed in your job that you were able to use as a student? And then uh, Carlos, after you, we'll, we'll pivot to Judy. Okay. Um, I think communication skills, uh, I think the ability to, well, electronically being able to send emails for, uh, the, in, the, in the right way, email etiquette, um, presenting myself in a way that people can rely on me and trust the work that I'm doing, not only my employer, but also my professors. If, I, if I'm asking them for extra time on a deadline, they need to trust that I will meet that deadline or that I will communicate with them in case of anything. So definitely communication and being able to advocate for myself in a professional way. I think that's something that I've applied, you know, both ways. As a graduate student right now, I still apply that, so. I'm still a student. <laughs> it never stops. <laughs> and I would say that for me, self-advocacy is something I learned at Arupe, learning to advocate for myself, especially as a DACA recipient. And that's something that easily has translated to my work environment when I'm an 
project and I have a lot going on and my manager's asking me to do more things. I'm like, wait, hold up. I have all this on this plate. I need I need a break. Like we need we need to find a way to get this done and make sure that we're meeting deadlines. Thanks to you both. I think those are, are those are great answers. And as Carlos's colleague, I can attest, his emails are uh, exceptional. A perfect punctuation, uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, so Lizette, you've had a chance to now listen to a lot of uh, these comments, kind of reflecting on your research and applying the themes. So I'm just curious, what are you hearing that resonates with you? What, um, how does this kind of uh, intersect with your research findings and um, just your kind of general takeaways from hearing these thoughtful people reflect on, on your research? Oh, absolutely. So first, it's always an honor just to to be around people who get the work that you do and find it interesting, right? I mean, so that's one. So thank you. I would say the first thing that resonates with me, and I want to first acknowledge both Chris and Steve, that leadership is really important in this, right? And understanding because the kind of tone setting, look, I say is there, you know, is a say do aligned or not? What you say and what you do, is it aligned or not, right? You know, when I talk with my son, I was like, the say do is not aligned right now, right? I have a teenager, we're going through some moments, but you know, but I but I, I think about that. I think about that for myself as a leader at work too. So that's really important that as leaders, you understand values are lived. Values are lived actions. And so if you care about the student and you say you care about the student, are the structures aligned? to support those students. And so I know both Chris and Steve believe that deeply and just hearing in their comments is really moving to me. So I thank you both for that um, because that's not always the, that's not always the case. Uh, I, to Carlos and Judy, when I was hearing them speak and I, and, and I but I, the last thing I want, also in the research, I wanna say there are a variety of different ways of thinking about integration. I actually went a lot of the route that Chris did, which was a cohort based way of doing that because it was important to create a social group that also had the same understanding and context that provided an extra level of an extension of their social capital when they went to work as well too. So that was an important, so, and, and that, you know, so there may be some hindrance, but I don't want to take away the unbelievable value added of a cohort, right? And Steve's approach to and saying, well, I'm gonna just do it on this day of the week. That works as well. There's gonna be a variety of ways of doing it. There is no one way of doing it. But the fact that you ask the question and you answer the question and provide the dedicated time, right? We give time to what matters. If you give time for students to work and acknowledge that work is a value and it's gonna support them going forward, you're already ahead of the game, okay? So I wanna I, I thank you both. When I hear Carlos and Judy, I mean, come on, I'm ready to hire them both tomorrow, right? So, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, this, it's this thing. It's um, the research that I do is also very emotional, right? And um, I have people who read it and some people will call me crying about it and say, wow, you really just said the story that, that I'm experiencing. Um, and I hold that with high regard because it is deeply personal um, and yet it's also academic and important research that needs to happen. Um, so I thank you for seeing your stories or hearing your stories in there. And I encourage both of you to continue elevating your voices and doing that. Carlos, the fact that you're working with young people, how lucky are we? How lucky are we? Really, you know, the difference you're gonna make. And, and Judy, your story about how to advocate for yourself, I heard that from so many Latinas. That work was a critical way of really understanding not just worker identity, but what it meant to be an independent female who advocated for herself. I thought that was a really, so when you said those things, it was very, I heard that over and over again. So thank you so much. And thank you, Sam, for putting this together if I didn't say that earlier. <laughs> Absolutely, no, thank you, Lizette. And I think I speak for the entire audience when I say uh, that we are privileged to be able to spend the hour listening to you and uh, your research and to the, the panelists share their perspectives. Um, so we're, we're exactly at time. It's an hour. I know everybody in the panel and also in the audience is very busy, so we'll close. This panel has been recorded, uh, so we will share both the audio and the video uh, with uh, registrants, and you'll be able to share with your networks as well. Um, but on behalf of everyone at CTB, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.